Yeah. Feel free. Are you okay if they ask questions? Absolutely. Right? Yeah. Feel free to interrupt me too uh, if you have any questions. But uh, I just did a speech at the Historical Society last week, which encompassed ba mainly just the images that you see on the left. So those historical composites really didn't come to be until a lot of experimenting with some of the other time lapse methods, as well as kind of understanding editing as far as you know, understanding darkroom editing, because a lot of times digital, you know, a lot of the terms, terminology is the same and everything. But what you're seeing here is historical composite, time lapse composite, and then a uh, composite of like the Milky Way. And we'll talk a little bit about that. It's kind of a whole process till it got to there, but this right here would have been my first cell phone at age 16, 2006. And we didn't even have a camera phone until I got these two. And this one didn't last very long, but that would have been 2007, 2008, where really I got my first camera, you know. And so uh, prior to this, we had the old VCRs that you put on your shoulder and, you know, you'd do videos. So we did some of that. And then in later years, uh, you know, disposable cameras and everything like that. And so when I, uh, I originally went to school at Oklahoma State and then I transferred out to Middle Tennessee State and so this was technically my first camera and this was all film of course. So this was 35 millimeter, 50 millimeter lens and I bought this camera on, on Amazon because we had to have it for class and uh, I can't remember what other class I took or what, why I took this class and I didn't take another one but I really wasn't interested in photography that much at the time. It was a pretty tough class and, and honestly the most expensive because of the developing the paper the and I mean it's not easy either and so uh, you know I we had to shoot a whole roll one week in one week and then make three different prints out of that roll and then we would have like a class you know once a week to talk a little bit about it but these are just some of the ones that I saved nothing too spectacular I think probably this one would, would have been the best one according to everybody in the class and those were just some guys that were on campus handing out uh, some Bibles at the time and so I was just kind of you know experimenting with different techniques and of course you know learning lenses and everything like that and so at this same period of time I got into making films and the school that I went to was really well known for doing video production and everything and so I was a musician originally, so you see me holding the boom mic there a lot. So I was kind of seeing production second hand and I, I saw these cameras and lenses and I was like, why do they need all these lenses? And it didn't really make sense to me until much later. Um, but I mainly did audio for these sets, but uh, this production, our biggest one was the first student feature length film in Tennessee. And uh, it was over, 30 grand in funding or so and uh, it's still yet to be released but I have seen the final edit and they're they're kind of pushing it to different film festivals but that camera the airy flex in the bottom right that's an actual film camera so you can kind of see the housing where that film would be kind of in there really nice camera but again pretty expensive uh, to do these days and so my first uh, job out of college was doing yearbook photography so we used to really have like 60 schools I think they have like a hundred or so now and uh, we would kind of assembly line people I mean uh, you guys have done it what 18 times or 17 <laughs> times by now so uh, that's basically you know it was kind of interesting to learn from the portrait perspective and also understanding you know basic lighting and everything like that so that kind of helped as far as uh, understanding different parts of photography that I was not yet aware of and then for the past five a little over five years I've been working at Channel 6 so uh, I'll probably be there a little more than usual this week with the snow <laughs> coming in but this is what I do mainly now so after about seven years it comes full circle and I'm back on an audio board so I run the audio board for the morning show usually I didn't work this morning but I usually get up pretty early you can see a, an image of the studio there so we have some broadcast cameras that uh, you know have some really great definition and uh, we use those and do kind of specific stuff as well as this jib that's a 25 foot jib on a uh, controller so I do about 
20 hours of live TV a week and uh, a lot of crazy stuff can happen in those <laughs> amounts of time. And so uh, then I worked at the VOK for the last four years or so doing mainly camera for different events. I'd say we mainly do hockey and stuff like that, but we do have other events, including the March Madness that happened a few times. And uh, then over at the Cox Center, they do special events, but I've gotten the opportunity to actually direct some of uh, it as well. So that was kind of a fun experience. And uh, my second camera that I got, really the first digital camera that I got was an A6000 and we recorded this entire feature length documentary with it. And so at this point in 2015, I would have been uh, kind of interested in getting back out there and making uh, films and stuff. And so I got together with a friend of mine who's a blues musician and uh, we created this documentary that basically focused on four months leading up to his challenge where he goes to Memphis and competes in this international blues challenge. And uh, about over two years or so, we went into a handful of film festivals and won a handful of awards. We did a, a circle cinema screening, two sold out crowds for that. and. Uh, Basically, this was all shot on that A6000 and uh, on a $35 lens, in fact. So a lot of these uh, depth of field that you'll see in this video coming up was shot with that lens. And, uh, you know, if you understand the fundamentals, you can really get away with, you know, doing photography at a really affordable price. And so that's kind of, you know, what I want to champion is that you don't need the best camera in order to get sometimes the best results. <laughs> and uh, I guess maybe space bar. Maybe. I don't want to blow. Is there sound to it? I don't want to get it too loud. No, trust me, it's fine. I got okay. it. Okay. There's going to be a, a little videos, but well, you no, could probably really turn it down just a little bit. But this is uh, basically he's uh, competing in this international blues challenge with over two thousand acts or over a thousand acts. And uh, th this is a $35 lens, you know, just, it's a 1.7, so super, super wide, a 35 millimeter. So in September, I won the Blues Challenge in Tulsa. Just some tracking shots. That was with the kit lens from that Sony, in fact. This is that depth of field, really exaggerated, you know. This was actually shot on my phone with one of the attachable lenses. And he uh, competed again against about a thousand acts, and he had two performances. And this kind of shows, you know, it's called "It's the Blues." Talks about kind of the struggle as a blues musician and everything. So those are some of the judges that he he had to compete or compete for. And you can see all the musicians that were once there to compete, all the comp competition and everything. So that's kind of what the stories about. So lots of stabilizer. A stabilizer I bought for like a hundred dollars, you know. So understanding kind of video editing and stuff, we were able to kind of compile this together. And uh, so we, it's about an hour long or so. It's available on YouTube now. Uh, and it's been getting quite a few plays. We just released it recently. But after this film, I had been doing kind of commercials and different stuff, like uh, just kind of promotional stuff, not anything that would play on TV, but just kind of social media promotional stuff. And uh, I still had the camera, and so I was like, you know, I was always interested in doing time lapse, but I started on one of those old. Uh, was the Nokia 1020 which for the first time you know you had focus ISO control uh, shutter speed which went up to four seconds and uh, had one other uh, like a white balance kind of thing and so I, I learned to stand kind of the basics uh, with time lapse with that camera but didn't necessarily get the best results but uh, later on, I started to get into time lapse using this camera as well as astrophotography and stuff like this. 
So this uh, slider that you see right here, I bought in fact, uh, and that's just a motion control slider. You can kind of set the keyframes and then be able to move it wherever you want. And so I've kind of found different locations and over the last three or four years compiled a uh, kind of time-lapse documentary. This is just a, a reel from this is just a reel from last uh, last year. So there's a lot of hyperlapses. Um, this is actually some of the music that I make as well. So it kind of helps when you get the videos be able to use your own. So these are all hyperlapses, and I do these handheld because it's really the smoothest way to do it. This was on a tripod. You can see it's not as smooth. That's on top of the Mayo. This is some of that slider control going with the time. So kind of a sunset. Started it there. That was in reverse. That was a gathering place uh, image that they shared. That was fireworks last year. And I'll talk some more about this Milky Way stuff, as well as some of these stacking images. And so that was from the last two years, but it was my reel from last year. And so uh, when I when you do when I do time lapses, I can basically do three different things with them. You know, it's going to be obviously the sequence from start to finish, but you also have those individual files. So when you shoot raw, you know you're getting the full you know frame here but you're also getting really high definition so when I pull that into camera raw or whatever I can really elaborate and so this image actually from about three let's say 200 300 images I just chose three of these and one of which is the sky you know you pick your best sunset image and then I was kind of getting blown out because it was still daytime so I made this part night over here and then I blended basically the night, or night to, to present, uh, kind of more uh, sunset-y time. So you can see it's technically really like night here. So these two don't match up, and that's what gives it that kind of dynamic and that kind of cool look to it. So you can kind of see, you know, how these lights kind of much brighter, and then slowly you start to see kind of more of the sky. And so that's just created with the gradient, you know, on Photoshop. And, and basically creating, uh, you know, bringing the line down and then it, it basically creates that gradient for you, but the sky was all replaced. So that took, you know, kind of a pin, pin tool and kind of ma <coughs> masking it out. That's cool, because like with the nighttime it brings that color and connects it. That's yeah, it's very, uh, it's very unrealistic, but when you look at it, you don't really think of it being yeah. as unrealistic. And so this is the same kind of concept. This was, uh, in fact, a full sky replacement. So I was shooting some uh, lightning bolts and stuff, and uh, I took that particular frame and made that just the sky here, and then over these 200 images or so, you know, compiled every car that was going through this. So people that do star trails and stuff like that is the same concept. You're basically just stacking the amount of light over and over. And so that can be a little, uh, it's good for this part, but it's bad for certain other parts. So you'll get really blown out in here. So, it, you know, you can dodge and burn and create different um, uh, filters in order to control some of those lights, overblown lights. So this is the uh, same concept, another stacking method. And this is a uh, highway traffic, you know, over that entire time. And one of the coolest things being up here on the mid-continent tower, you can see the airplanes that had just taken off and then the airplanes that were landing over here. So when you do those stacks, you really kind of see, you know, things for, in a weird sense. And so when these were stacked, I actually had to go in and kind of adjust the brightness of each one of the streets basically just by creating a dodge and burn layer and then applying like black or dark to it and then vice versa doing that for the dark parts lighting those up so this is a, a stack that's three three individual masks in fact and so the sky is or I guess 
so there's there's a few different stacking methods and uh, one of them's lighten which it takes all your lights and stacks just the lights with the darks it stacks just your darks and so that's basically what I'm doing with this the sky is getting a darkened stack and the foreground is getting a lightened stack and then the city is just progressing as regular uh, light so this is kind of a lot going on but you'll see the, scar, the st sky starts to stack the darkest parts of the image and the brightness from the highway is starting to stack those lights and so this was really I haven't experimented with this technique a whole lot more but people really kind of uh, enjoyed the way that it turned out and, and I, I was too but um, I planned on doing some kind of tutorial to kind of show some of this but that was all masked uh, in After Effects due to the fact that it was a video and then this is uh, 4th of July a few years ago and this would have been a time lapse where it started during the day and what I did was stack all the the fireworks that where people were shooting off so you can kind of see in different areas the real fireworks shows a little further out of frame but this is looking directly to the east on downtown and you can see those kind of fireworks uh, and so this is again just a stacking method using specific parts of the light and so now we're getting to star trails so the whole st stacking method really became apparent to me by using uh, star trails and basically it takes every star in the image and then combines to create you know kind of a uh, an intent a continuous trail and uh, everything rotates around the north star so the more further you get towards the north you know these are going to be more circular and the more towards you get to the horizon they're a lot more vertical and so that's basically what you're looking at is the rotation of the earth in relation to the stars and so this is uh, out in Tulsa Hills, actually the hotel parking lot just right next to uh, that hotel. I don't know which one it is, but Quick Trip would be kind of in the bottom left. And I just got this uh, long lens, my 150 or 200 lens, and uh, shot this one of a, a rising moonrise. And then I stacked this one kind of linear so that you would see the moon here, 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 and here. So if you were to just stack it straight up, a time lapse like that, you'd end up with a result like this. So it kind of looks like a bullet or something. But you know, being able to linear do it, you know, moon here, moon here, kind of looks a little more symmetrical. And you can see I started with a little linear action and then started with the original stack there. And uh, you can see some of those uh, airplanes and stuff that had went through the frame as well. This would be, uh, we had a, one of the super moons rise right over downtown. This is kind of a popular location. In fact, the moon rises here multiple times a year if you find yourself out there on Chandler Park and get kind of a long lens. Uh, but you'll need to adjust for uh, <clears throat> exposure and everything like that, usually you know, really low ISO. Uh, this is one that I shot. Um, during the lunar eclipse from two years ago, maybe a year ago, and this is downtown the Williams building, and I was I was downtown, I just got off work, because sometimes I work in the evenings as well, and uh, I got off and I was like, man, how am I gonna, you know, create an image with being downtown for one, and also, you know, trying to take advantage of the the moon at, at that high of an angle you know it gets brighter as it rises and so I was able to this is actually one shot uh, so I was able to um, create this one all in one shot and that light that you see on the left side is actually just one of the signs that was kind of lighting up that side of the tower and that kind of gave it a uh, kind of cool contrast you know and uh, that one uh, took off a lot online people really like that one so sometimes you're kind of surprised at what people like oh uh, well yeah I, I've seen this somewhere. Oh, okay I yeah don't, I don't know where you usually share your photos but that, that looks, I, I have seen that picture yeah uh, I usually you know Facebook sometimes gets a little out of control with people sharing things so 
it could have been there it could have been on Instagram uh, I know some of the more popular posts will appear if you're following specific uh, hashtags or whatever this was uh, pretty much shot uh, right in the middle of the road. It was about 11 o'clock on a Sunday night, and uh, we had the lunar eclipse kind of already going here. And, uh, you know, I kind of initially, you know, went to focus on the moon just to have kind of the best uh, detail on that. And uh, I took a few of these shots where the moon was kind of on the right side, on the left side. Then I was like, well, I'll just do it right in the middle. And so it was kind of, uh, you know, taking a shot, realigning, taking another shot. But I'd say, I'd say ISO 100, it would have been, I think, an 85 millimeter or 150 millimeter zoomed in. And then uh, probably one one hundredth of a shutter speed or so I would guess I don't know exactly but it's somewhere around that you know I, well, most of my stuff I shoot ISO really really low uh, unless I'm doing like Milky Way stuff which you know kinda pushes it to the whole other end of the spectrum highest high ISO you know sixteen to thirty two thousand uh, almost twenty seconds to thirty seconds long of an exposure of a shutter speed and, uh, you know, it takes a little bit of editing as well to kind of make the Milky Way pop. And uh, kind of the key, the key to that is basically when you take a shot like this, you're going to be kind of, in a, you're going to be a little, this color is not going to show up as much, but you will see this kind of haziness. And so when you get into like Lightroom or something, you can just create a mask right there on the Milky Way arm. And then what you do is basically change the color temperature. So you just go down, you know, or go up with it, you know, get a little more uh, kind of warmer color. And uh, same with the tint. You could add some more purple or whatever. And that really makes it pop. And you can't really see that mask because it's uh, just, it, it blends pretty well. But this is out in Zion, uh, Utah. And so what I use for my Tulsa Pass stuff as well as uh, this stuff is the same lens, a, a, a Rokinon 12 millimeter 2.0. And so, if the key to astrophotography is really getting your focus set, it's going to be one of the main things. And then, you know, being able to high high ISO, which you know, my camera is kind of a, a prosumer camera. If I had a you know more expensive camera, I could even crank that ISO even higher. But, I mean, I think it really comes down to the lens, you know. The wider the angle, the longer you're going to have an open exposure. And that's just because of uh, what they call the 500 rule. So when you're taking uh, a longer exposure than 30 seconds, the stars start to move on you. So they're not really as, um, as crisp and, you know, they might have like a trailing look to it. And so you're kind of limited at that, and then the next step up from there would be actually having a camera on a mount that rotated with the Earth 15 degrees an hour. And then you can do, you know, minute long exposures, longer exposures. People that do like galaxies and stuff like that, they're usually on a mount and then they're zoomed in. And so I haven't really experienced too much of that. I, my dad does a whole bunch of telescope stuff, and he's got like the iPhone connector that you can put on there, and you know, you get decent results but uh, definitely not the same and so this is uh, out in Utah as well this is a uh, canyon lands which is kind of one of the darkest or what they call the dark sky association some of the darkest skies in the nation and so that also helps with uh, with photographing it but one of the issues I had with this is the moon was out so the moon was out over here you can see it's really bright so it kind of messed up that part of the frame. And then we had some traffic that kind of gave some cool uh, stuff there. But this, we were kind of limited on time. We we're actually on vacation. So I just kind of got, got out real quick. But it's crazy to see how many of those uh, airplanes are going over, you know, in the middle of Moab, Utah, s south, uh, south uh, east Utah. 
on my YouTube I actually have a tutorial basically start to finish on how to do Milky Way photography uh, but in late 2016 I got a pixel stick which if anyone knows what that is it's basically a six foot stick with 200 lights that go from top to bottom and you can program it to be whatever image you want so over the last few years I do kind of an annual pixel stick photo and obviously the most recent 2020 there and uh, so it's a little hard to understand so this video kind of puts it into perspective a little bit better so we're shooting long exposure that's basically you know the main photography that we're shooting so I take a 10 second long exposure the cameras go and now my buddy just walks in front and the light kind of sc scans it off and so by the time you look at the camera you know over that amount of time you're getting the results of how you kind of walked in front of it so I'll show it one more time so this camera just took the picture as he's walking it's compiling the images and since he's wearing kind of black and everything you can't really see him made out in it and because he's moving so quickly but with light you know it's it's always going to be no matter how long the exposure is and you can see that with the car trail uh, in the background so this car actually goes by and it's the same thing if you know if a long exposure with the car or long exposure with the stick you can see that car went by and then right over here you can see the trail of uh, the back of the car or whatever so that was about eight to ten seconds long of an exposure there and then this <laughs> So this was a promotional thing that uh, I did to try to get Guthrie Green's attention. And uh, I can't remember, it's been a while, I can't think they shared it or something. But this is the same thing, but a time lapse using that same technique. So we had to walk back and forth like 50 times, you know, <laughs> to get this going. And you can see kind of some of the dynamics of that. But we, we've had some fun with the uh, pixel stick and hopefully try to get out some more. This is one we did for a 24-hour film fest. So we had to uh, have these logos inside the video, but they didn't say how or anything. So we kind of took it to the next level. And instead of just putting their logos, we actually created kind of their logos in different locations around town. Living Arts downtown, of course, and then the Philbrook downtown. So this is one we did for the Tulsa Film Fest a uh, year before last. And so the concept is basically, you know, a writer is the kind of the main guy behind the story. So when he puts his pen down, you know, we had everything freeze. And so this was shot with two different times, a green screen and a time lapse all on a slider. And so uh, I'll play it one more time. This uh, part was shot just as a hyperlapse going forward. And then these other ones the camera was on a slider and it did the same move twice but one was in real-time video and one was real-time time-lapse and so we had to put a green screen there in order to uh, key that out and make it stop in time so that was kind of a fun project that we did this is kind of uh, switching gears I guess to Tulsa Pass which has been kind of the main Thing most recently but you can see those gas pumps maybe play it one more time the gas pumps uh, right there the kind of the holes in the ground where the gas used to be fed and that crack and everything are still the same spot so that kind of helps align it when I'm out there so I knew that you know the fireplace would line up about here and then this would be here ish so you kind of look at these specific things and mainly one of the things I was looking at was this crack right here because you could really see those guys where they were kind of standing and everything. But uh, that's uh, an old Phillips 66 station. So the, the garage bay that you see on the far side, that was actually added in 41. And then on this side would have been the uh, cottage style station. So Tulsa Pass, you know, the reason that I brought up all the other stuff prior to this is you know Tulsa Pass didn't really exist up in or wouldn't have it existed as well as it does without you know all the experience of other types of photography so a friend of mine posted this historic image he kind of he kind of uh, collects historic images and everything and you can see he posted the Google Maps image right there and so I mean he basically gave me both images to work with and so this was the first uh, Tulsa Pass 
kind of project and you can see you know we've obviously lost this uh, big building on the left that was a uh, old music venue built at the exact same time that the Mayo was built which is on the far right 1925 so this was kind of the first uh, when it first started it was just past and present so present past back and forth and so that's where the name comes from Tulsa past to present so Tulsa past is what it ended up being and then su subsequently since I've made a uh, Facebook it's become time travel Tulsa uh, but this is over there on Boston Street and that building that you see right here is actually right behind the building that's there currently so it would have been like the 30s and uh, it's looking straight up Boston And then as the project evolved, it became kind of more seamlessness. So uh, instead of filling the entire frame, it was taking different parts of the historic image and creating, you know, for instance, this Gates Hardware. That's a hardware store that's now a, a Elgin Park, the pizza place and bar. That's right across from the Driller Stadium. Um, and so that was the first one that actually was featured in Tulsa People, and I'll talk a little bit about that here in a little bit. But this is uh, the Brady down in the Arts District, some snow on the ground, kind of a cool justification, you know, summer and, and winter kind of existing in the same time. And uh, one of the first images uh, was one of the Loans Building, which is right outside the Masonic Temple. Uh, it's owned by somebody at the Burnson Center now. And uh, they were installing an air conditioning across the street onto the ONG building. And so this is some kind of news photographer went out there and kind of took some pictures of people, you know, looking up at it. And so that's kind of how that one came to be. And then, of course, uh, Bob Wills's bus right there, which Bob Wills was uh, kind of a legendary musician from Tulsa, got a start on KVOO and was broadcast nationwide and kind of created what we call Western Swing. So very lucky to have him in Tulsa as well. And then the project uh, kept evolving into uh, really finding, instead of just finding any image, it was kind of finding the best and highest resolution. And so this is the KC Auto Hotel, which the building obviously you can see from the top still there, but everything on the block surrounding going down that way is gone. The PAC loading docks right there on the left, so we're looking straight down Cincinnati near 3rd. And uh, this is a KC Auto Hotel, which has a cafe no longer there. The barber shop's still there. Uh, and then you can even see gas pumps. So back in the day, you could actually fuel your car here, and they would clean it out as well. And uh, the place even had a miniature golf course on top for a little while, so people could, uh, I guess, you know, have a little bit of recreation in their vehicle spots. So this is Swan Lake, and this was, because uh, this image actually went up sure. to about right here, and so you could see some of the houses and everything, but all those trees and everything blocked me from really connecting anything, and so I was like, you know, what if I just kind of leave it just the pond? And uh, the only thing that I really had to match up with was and it's hard to see it, of course, but you can see the shadow where it would, the sun would have been coming, and then the very corner of this pond slash fountain, and you can see that it's uh, kind of roped off there because that's where the ice was a little thinner. But of course, you can't do this these days. So they were ice skating on Swan Lake. Yeah. So this would have been a kind of a you know originally this was Tulsa's first amusement park. This area now it's a residential area. In fact. Uh, the swimming pool is, uh, or the swimming house, I guess, is actually the basement of a different building now. So actually someone lives in that house, and it's just right to the left if you were looking that way. And then the hospital, obviously, Utica Square, towards that direction. And uh, this one is, in 1957, they buried a car, and maybe your parents have mentioned this before but in 57 they had this idea of bearing a time capsule and of course that's what they did but last minute they had this uh, Plymouth Belvedere and they were like you know 
we'll throw the car in there with the time capsule. And over the years, things have gotten miscommunicated. So everyone thinks the time capsule was the car, but really there was two different things. They had a big hole in the ground there for a while, but in 2007, they lifted the car up and it was in really bad shape because some water had got in there. So it was basically a big rust bucket, but they buried another one in 98, uh, Plymouth Prowler, which is over there at Centennial Park. What's interesting about this one is the guy that's the DX promotional guy, he's got gasoline that they're putting in with the car. And at this time, you know, the common idea was that cars were going to run on nuclear energy. So, you know, you'd only need like a fingernail of plutonium and the car would run forever which that's why they put the gasoline in there but you know with our satellites that we sent off in the 70s that are you know the furthest reaches of space they are running on you know nuclear energy and stuff like that so that's how they kind of you know burn their fuel but this was one i did for tulsa people uh last july um or june something like that so just as I kept doing this project it kind of evolved and so Tulsa people kind of got word of it and uh, the article came out in October they reached out to me a few months earlier about being featured and doing an interview and then I kept doing it you know and it kind of evolved until eventually they were like you know do you want hired on to do a monthly piece and so by January 2019 that was my first uh, uh, piece right there and that's the KTUL building that's over there on Boulder and so when I go out there you know I take the historical picture I put it onto my phone just for reference and then I get my you know camera and try to line up the different things about it and uh, then I'll take the picture edit it and then composite it and then at this point you know kind of like the time lapses I can do a few different things with this so I could leave it as is as a picture, I could create a video sequence, or I could create a lenticular, which I'll get into those uh, briefly as well. So what we're looking at here is uh, when people ask where do I get my resources from, you know, some of the key resources, some of the rarer stuff would be from individuals, and that's kind of how this project originally started was that Facebook post and everything. The Tulsa Historical Society has over 35,000 photos. The library has all these archives that are available online, but uh, on their third floor they have really rare stuff as well. And then of course the Tulsa University, or the University of Tulsa, uh, has uh, a special collection too. And uh, one of the great questions that I had uh, last weekend at the Historical Society was, uh, an issue about copyright essentially mm -hmm. and you know people ask how do I get permission to use the photos or whatever it is and uh, the the way that I see it and of course someone would probably argue with me but I you know I always ask for permission but the fact that it's a transformative work under copyright law technically is a, a new thing within itself but at the same time, I also claim fair use, which allows me to use educational purposes and stuff like that. The time machine that these are kind of how these are created is, you know, luckily you guys know kind of the history of photography and how it's changed over the years. And, you know, lenses were used to be made kind of all crazy. And, you know, me using a wide angle lens I actually have, you know, abrasions and different things that push the lens in specific directions. So when I take these historical photos that were sometimes shot on a long lens or shot on a different lens than I use, it takes a little bit of adjusting in order to get those images to lay up straight. And then I use Photoshop as well as, you know, other raw editing to kind of push the images a little bit further. And then finally I use uh, this thing called the Nick Collection. So when you get all these combined, you basically see um, this video right here. So this is the process. Start by aligning it, and then here's the adjustments for the lens, you know, kind of showing that wide angle. That's a dodge and burn technique, basically creating more contrast within the building. And then now this is just masking, you know. So with masking, if you mask out too much, you can always bring it back, you know, with the X, X key. 
And uh, with this one, there was a lot of contrast on the building itself to really line up those like white parts and everything. So this one was a little easier than some, you know, sometimes there's not a building there at all. And so I'm having to kind of compile it on, uh, you know, faith in a sense. And so now I start to mask out the edges and then I'll bring in a kind of sky layer, you know, to give it a little glow on either side. But there's the final composite, so you can see there's a lot more kind of contrast and, and like color built to it, and that's where those uh, the Nick collection filters come in. So this is the same building. This would have been a little closer up, and this is Bader Supply, which was a refrigeration supply company there until about the 60s or so. And uh, like I was saying, this one's a little more seamless because of the um, plants on either side so I you know that was kind of an artistic choice was to cover up the historic picture of those uh, plants on the side or leave them and so that took a little bit of masking that out in order to get you know that just perfect which um, some images will work for that some of them you know just don't really work as well but that's kind of uh, a, a little different than some of the ones I usually do just by masking in certain objects that happen to be there already. And so, or go back just real quick. See this Bader supply, the B on the, uh, the storefront, and then now you can go forward. And so the B, the B on the sign, Benny's Billiards, this is from Rumblefish, a, a familiar face, Nicholas Cage right there, Matt Dillon right there. So when the Outsiders shot two weeks after that, they went into full production of Rumblefish, and this was shot in the same spot as that Valkyrie, or word Valkyrie now, and that's again Matt Dillon and uh, Nicolas Cage. This was Nicolas Cage's first movie shot here in Tulsa. He actually went under the name Nicolas Coppola, which he was Francis Ford Coppola's nephew. And so that image right there is basically what you see uh, right here. And so I, uh, we pass by this, I do the Outsiders tours on the weekends. So this is uh, images from the Outsiders, but I, I, I drive the bus and give the tours for the Outsiders house on the weekends. And so this was the only spot that Outsiders and Rumblefish both filmed in the same location. And you can see the Tulsa Arts District looking directly to the east there. This is right after the Rumble when they get pulled over. And so you can see those storefronts, you know, are basically nothing's changed there. And these buildings go back to the late 1920s. Now we're getting to lenticulars a little bit. This is uh, some of the bookmarks that you just saw. These are lenticulars, which basically, as you can see, depending on how you look at them, they're going to either see one image or the other. And so this uh, image that I think I have on the next slide gives, yeah. And so. For instance, with those last ones, you know, they're, they're tilting like this, so we would be looking at them like this, but you can also tilt them so they go side to side. So basically what you're seeing is, if you're looking at it from this perspective, all the blue, which is on the left side of this lens, you're just gonna see that part. And so when you're over here, you're gonna see this one. So basically this lens that you put on here split up the image like you see here basically how whenever I print them off my computer they look basically like this is interlaced one image right here one of them over here but it gets even more technical but there's people that do like 3d and stuff so that's kind of what you see on the right side there they interlace it in a whole different way to give it depth when you look at it hmm. and so I really just scratch the surface on on lenticulars but they do exactly what I need them to do is basically Instead of having screens all over the art exhibit, you know, we just have prints that can be easily made. So in order to kind of fine tune things, you get the lens and you put the lens onto like a, what they call a pitch test. So for instance, I, sh I print at uh, 720 uh, pixels per inch. And when I print these off, I have to have, by definition, nine pixels of each image right next to each other so I mean super super small mm. but if you just do nine then it doesn't line up because my printer is actually a little bit off and so by using these pitch tests you can kind of calculate so that those pixels can be kind of spread apart to fit in there the only issue is there's not a percentage of a pixel there's only one pixel it's as low as you can get 
And so you actually have to go into Photoshop and change your overall percentage of the image in order to get those pixels to fall into place. And so a lot of people that do these don't like to share their process. So it was a, you know, I started last July and, and I didn't think I was really successful with it until late fall or so. So I mean, it, it definitely took uh, some time and some money and, and, you know, I bought my own printer, which not, not anything spectacular, but you can do this with most, you know, average printers these days. And the lenses I just buy uh, online. So there's the printing process. And so when it comes out, you basically have this interlaced image. Hard to see it with this, but it kind of looks transparent, you know. And then by the time you put that lens on it, you can start to see, you know, once you get it adhered right, then you can kind of see through it or not see it at all. And so this next one is a uh, image that's just uh, on Greenwood North. And so this was uh, Greenwood, as we know it, right there near Langston, very heavily populated um, urban renewal, you know, and desegregation to the area led led the area to be kind of neglected. Yeah, here's another one straight uh, a little further up the street. And again, there's no businesses here anymore, but there was at one point in time. And so this uh, fire hydrant is still the same one that this guy ran into back in the 60s. <laughs> <laughs> it's a pretty strong fire ride. <laughs> and this is the Sand Springs Railway. So if you've eaten at Fat Guys in the Greenwood District, this is right behind it. The baseball park's right there on the left. And that's the uh, Sand Springs Railway, which read, led passenger customers on the rails from Sand Springs to Greenwood until 1955. And uh, it's great with that girl kind of peeking around the corner there. Uh, this is one of the last few slides. Um, this is just the, the most recent Tulsa People piece. And a lot of times I do kind of sidecar. But a lot of times when people ask questions, what my favorite ones to do are usually these ones where, you know, you have the oldest image possible. So this is, a, you know, the fire department that were, instead of having trucks, they were on horses to go, you know, fight fires. And then this is the exhibit at the Historical Society, which is open now until June. Uh, 25 images, nine of which are those uh, changing lenticulars. And uh, definitely, if you get a chance, it's, uh, it's free every Saturday, uh, first Saturday of the month, and uh, I think like $5 otherwise. And then uh, to follow up, there's a lot going on here. Uh, like I said, the Historical Society, that'll be open until June. Uh, my website has a little bit of everything. I'm kind of currently always updating it. Uh, the Time Travel Tulsa on Facebook as well as New Media where I do the time lapse stuff. Some of the tutorials will be PMC New Media YouTube as well as the Instagram pages uh, which she shared on, on Instagram so you can find those simple enough. And I think that's, that's it. That's it. So. Awesome. Well thank you so much.